Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Colonization. This is post-commentary on the missions that were conducted during the live stream on November 1st. Our first mission is to test docking of a Dragon version 2 capsule to our station already in orbit and to transfer a Kerbal to the spinning centrifuge module to see if the Kerbal can get some exercise to satisfy the Keep Fit mod. Just a reminder, this is all in the Realism Overhaul set of mods for Kerbal Space Program, so we're operating on Earth in the real solar system. The mod list is in the video description. So the reason I wanted to test this out first is because of the way the docking port is placed in the nose cone. I wanted to make sure that worked out. And also because of the trunk, the little portion that attaches to the capsule. Uh, that has technically two decouplers on it, but I needed to make sure that it works. So it first has a decoupler to separate off the second stage, but then it has another decoupler, and this is in the description of the part in the parts menu, uh, another decoupler to separate from the capsule. So the question is whether that would work out correct or not. Uh, I've had trouble with that before and what we would need to do in order to fix it if there is trouble with that. So that's another thing we need to figure out. And of course we also will want to know whether the capsule can return back home safely. The Twitch audience is always very helpful and in this case they remind me to put the parachute on. Technically the Dragon Capsule can land without the parachute. It has those Super Dracos to make a soft landing. But it would be good to test the parachute as well. And actually it's got a texture on it that shows where it goes on the logo there. You see there how it lines up. Okay, so I try and get that right. Uh, now it's a, sort of a dodgy business to try and test this with a Kerbal in the first place. Uh, and because it's so dodgy I decide to recruit one of the Twitch viewers uh, as my first victim. And so Mitko here uh, gets drafted, but interestingly with this draft Twitch viewers mod, it doesn't automatically put them into the capsule, so I have to go back into the VAB and uh, load Mitko in. I'm not entirely sure why that is, or maybe there's some mod conflict, or maybe the portrait was just not showing up. Anyway, because we have to sync up with the station, which is at the same inclination as the moon, we have to launch at night time, hence movie time's night vision here. And a lot of viewers mention virtual audio cable as a way of getting the in-game audio without the background music and commentary, but you guys forgot that I'm speeding up the launch video to go to real time, so I have to speed it up by four times or two times, and so the original audio would be compressed and sound weird. So I've added the engine sounds in editing instead, which will be better. Also, chatter wouldn't sound right. The voices will be even squeakier than normal. So anyway, we do have engine sounds that I added later on, and that allowed me to use the KW Rocketry engine sounds, which I prefer anyway. Another flaw in using virtual audio cable is actually the fact that I want to record the original live stream. I want the original music and original commentary on the recording and so I wouldn't want to record the live stream without that stuff. Looks like the Falcon 9 is making its way quite splendidly out from Cape Canaveral here and uh, I will be reserving some fuel in the first stage to simulate the recovery of it even though stage recovery isn't working and we can't actually see the recovery of it. That's the downside. I don't actually reserve enough for me to have been able to recover the first stage on my own, but I think I still reserve more than SpaceX actually does when they launch these things and attempt to recover them. There we go, separation. And second stage ignition looks good. Uh, well, except for the plume being in the wrong place, but uh, well, I'll fix that down the road. There's a lot of other stuff that needs to be fixed, as we'll soon see in this test. But uh, yeah, Miko proceeds to to the target altitude. The station is at 400 kilometers by 400 kilometers, so we're going to a fairly high orbit here. And we'll see engine cut out soon here. Okay, 470 by 211. And that would be uh, uh, an orbit to catch up to the station. Unfortunately, I didn't really time the launch very well. And so the station is like on the opposite side of the planet right now. Then we hit into another problem, which is, as you can see, we have no connection. How do we have no connection? We have a Kerbal inside, right? But as it turns out, the Dragon version 2 capsule needs two crew members to operate, not just one. So it says not enough crew. Right now it's being controlled by the probe core at the top of the second stage, which means that if I separate the second stage, we'll have no control. Uh, and of course we have to obey remote tech, so 
Right now, we only have control when we're in communication. But since we were supposed to test decoupling, I do test that, but I have quick saved. I pressed F5 to quick save. And, okay, that decoupling decouples it from the capsule, but what about the other decouple? Well, I clicked that other decouple and it shudders. But I don't see anything else happening right now. Yep, uh, okay, well, let's use the RCS to move forward. No, no, it's not separating from the second stage at all. So there seems to be something wrong with that. But hey, that's why I tested it. And uh, here, now, because it's gonna take so long to meet up with the station, I decided to bring my orbit down, bring the apoapsis down a bit. And so we're settling the fuel down for the second stage engine. The second stage engine can relight 10 times, so I'm just going to burn some of its fuel to bring the apoapsis down. Probably needs to do a little bit more than that. There we go. By the way, our Kerbal has plenty of supplies because there are supplies for 7 Kerbals in that capsule. So, no problem uh, time warping through all this. The only problem is, I was having a bad day as far as plotting maneuvers to rendezvous. And with our Delta V situation, since we're carrying the second stage with us, that's a bit of a problem. Now we've got that extra burden, and here I like the Super Dracos. Those are hypergolic. And uh, yeah, we're, we're burning through our fuel quite quickly, and I'm also very impatient at this point because so much has already gone wrong. And the net result of this is that I overdo the attempt to uh, sort of push myself towards the target. And I am going too fast as we approach the target. As you can see here, our relative velocity is faster than the delta V we have to burn it off. So I can't rendezvous. Now, some people suggested EVAing the Kerbal over to the station and stuff like that but I like to keep my Kerbal safe. So the net result is we were going to have to launch a rescue mission. And we're gonna have to do that with more than two Kerbals, about well, two or more Kerbals anyway. And a decoupler there. You can see I'm placing the additional decoupler so that we can separate off the second stage as would be necessary normally. Because of the weird location of the attachment node on the second stage, I had to use the offset gizmo in order to get it to look right. So you saw me doing that there. And now I've got three new Kerbals, all recruited from the Twitch viewers. By the way, I do have texture replacer and additional texture packs for the Kerbals for variety, even though I don't seem to have the icon at the top there. Okay, anyway, here we go, Falcon 9 launch again. Again, in the dark because we're rendezvousing with the same inclination. And we definitely don't want to correct the inclination in low Earth orbit, that would be bad. So you see, the effect of Texture Replacer has been to give two of our Kerbals mustaches. And we also have a female Kerbal on board as well. Falcon line looking brilliant thanks to the fact I'm speeding the video up. Of course, on the original launch it was painfully slow uh, and choppy, but uh, yep, the benefits of video editing. Somebody in the comments asked about the long-term plans for this series, and there are long-term plans, I forgot to mention it in the first episode. Uh, we had discussed it on the live stream, and the first thing is of course Mars, that's my first goal. But after that, we wanted to go for one of the moons of Jupiter, as you can see here. I reserved some of the first stage fuel for recovery, and we go on with the second stage as planned. Uh, so one of the moons of Jupiter, probably Europa, but if some unforeseen Kraken prevents us from landing on Europa, then maybe one of the other ones will do. And then uh, there was talk about uh, exploring Titan and Triton, so Titan the moon of Saturn and Triton the moon of Neptune. And also Pluto. I think we definitely want to have some boots on the ground on Pluto. Uh, that, considering I haven't actually landed a Kerbal on Mars yet, uh, Pluto, we'll see. I'll, I'll try. I mean, I want to try. Anyway, here we go. We are in orbit. Uh, relatively low orbit to catch up. And this time the approach distance is not so bad, but not great either. Okay, I am using the fuel on the second stage to help us out with the rendezvous. I'm boosting up deliberately because we're actually ahead of the target. And so I'm trying to slow down. And I'm taking full advantage of the second stage fuel in order to do this. So we boosted our apoapsis very high. And we'll use the second stage again 
to bring it back down again once it's time. I'm conserving fuel in the capsule with the Super Dracos in order to make the rendezvous with the station. I still intend to do that. Okay, well there's our target, and so here again I'll use the second stage in order to uh, do the rendezvous and slow down to match the target. You can see the ignitions remaining and the fact that ullage is measured here, so we need the propellant stable. Okay. Well, that didn't get us quite there yet, so I'm going to need to use the Super Dracos a bit. But anyway, after all of that, we are lined up like this. Approaching the other capsule still attached to its second stage. Now it is my intention to use the Dragon Capsule as the main way to get Kerbal's 2 LEO and then back to the surface, but we have to make sure that works out alright. There are other vehicles in the works like the Shuttle, and uh, a Moon Chaser, which is a variant on Dream Chaser, which also launches on Falcon 9, but uh, yeah, those are a little bit dodgier because it's it takes a lot longer for them to re-enter as space planes, and also space planes are just inherently very difficult to re-enter in Realism Overhaul. Uh, here we are a bit off, so I turn that capsule towards the approaching rescue craft, if you will. It's the least that flawed capsule could do, I think. Okay, here approaching docking. Um, magnetism isn't uh, the same in Realism Overhaul as it is in stock. It's it's practically non-existent, so don't expect a whole lot of that kind of wiggling involved. And so I need to line up pretty precisely. And I uh, the first first approach, admittedly, I didn't do a very good job of it. Looking at this right here, I wonder about the little fins on the on the trunk of the Dragon Capsule. I I wonder why. <laughs> I mean. It doesn't seem like the capsule needs aerodynamic help, but but they're there. I mean, clearly it has fins, so that that's very interesting. Also, I should point out, Aaronim in chat noted that the Super Dracos are point, uh, poking out too far. I thought that they should be poking out so that that little label uh, it was visible, but actually they should be tucked into those slots much further so only the bottom black area is visible. And uh, right now they're poking out so much that they would be receiving heat. Uh, they're actually past the heat shield. So yeah, needed to fix that. Okay, well, like I said, the first docking didn't work out quite right. I have to back off and try again. And now this time, let's see if they can kiss. I'm trying really hard to get it just right, but uh, a little bit of a tilt there. Not quite there. Good enough. Good enough. Alright, so that works. At least they dock. Now, transferring Kerbal. That doesn't work. <laughs> Out of all things, uh, the docking ports are NASA docking systems. They should allow Kerbals to pass. And some of you will be trying to remind me that I need to open hatch, so I do do that. It's a little bit hard to get to those docking ports, but I do uh, open the hatch on both sides. And uh, still no luck, still no luck, so I have to eviate a Kerbal, and that is my way of getting a Kerbal into the other pod. Now, that does leave us with a Kerbal-less pod that is currently controlled only by the second stage of the Falcon 9. We are going to use that to try out the re-entry system. So basically, I'm going to have the second stage of this put this capsule, this uncrewed capsule, into a descent trajectory and then hope that the capsule can reorient to retrograde properly. So here we go. I aim for a decent periapsis, that's 80 kilometers. Seems like it's a good descent orbit. I double check the real chute. Since I won't have control, we are relying on the chutes to, well, the single chute to uh, deploy on its own, and I've armed it, you can see the marker is blue there. So I've armed the parachute. With control, of course, we could use the Super Dracos to make a soft landing, potentially, but uh, I don't think we have enough Delta V left in the pod anyway. 
So there goes the second stage, and I no longer have control over that pod. I do have control over the second stage, which is also re-entering, but there we are over Madagascar, and we will see how that goes. Meanwhile, I focus on the crude pod and uh, start getting it lined up with its rendezvous with the station. As you can see, it's still got, uh, well, it used to have 400 meters per second, now it has substantially less than that, but it should be enough to rendezvous with the station. Uh, remember that the station also has the same fuel, MMH and N204, so it can refuel this pod if necessary. Though, if the re-entry does not work out, there's no point, no point uh, bringing this back just yet until we figure out how to save it. Now, uh, here we are in the atmosphere with this uncrewed pod, and it's not orienting quite right right now, but once it gets to the thicker part of the atmosphere, it does turn around so its heat shield is flush against the, the flow of the air. And uh, again, I have no control over this. Uh, Smart ASS is not really controlling it. And we get to about 65 kilometers or so when things start heating up quite dramatically. We did not have a very low periapsis, so this is fairly mild in terms of re-entry trajectories. Uh, yet the parachute, as you can see, overheating there, I don't actually notice that because some of, uh, uh, this is when the Super Draco's point, uh, poking out was pointed out, so I was checking their temperature. I didn't realize the parachute would be a problem, but there goes the parachute, which means that we can't, we can't actually recover this anymore. Yep, uh, so parachute gone, and out of all things, the nose cone fairing, but you can see also we lost a docking system earlier. Somehow the docking system inside the fairing was the first thing to go, probably because the way it was clipping into the capsule, which irritates the thermal system completely. We really need that fixed, by the way. Anyway, so recovery was a failure. Uh, possibly if we had the Super Dracos functioning, that could have saved it, but not really, because we lost one of the Super Dracos if you take a look at that. So there'd be only three, and so there'd be asymmetric firing. Potentially, we could have just shut one down and then have two, and then it'd be symmetric, and that might be enough, but... Uh, it's dodgy business altogether from the look of it. We, we're gonna have to work on the configurations of that Dragon Capsule, clearly. Because obviously in real life the Dragon Capsule does work and is is recoverable. So we need to make sure that the configurations for this capsule uh, match reality. And I'll have to see how I can do that. Certainly the nose cone should not be burning off. That's, that's just a no-no. And uh, as far as the docking port, I can't see what I can do about that because otherwise it won't fit within the nose cone. Parachute, maybe something can be done with that, but it's certainly placed where it ought to be. Uh, the Super Dracos do need to be tucked in more though. Okay, so we're approaching the station and you can see me lining up the Dragon Capsule. And uh, just very carefully approaching. We've got four Kerbals now, that's four times the peril. Now during the live streams and in the comments on the YouTube videos, people have asked whether I'm going to develop new launchers, and broadly speaking, no. It's my intention that this should be taken as a series proposal, if you will, well, you know, semi-series proposal for what we should do in space, and so I'm going to be using just a few launchers, uh, one of each type. Basically, I want something of the Falcon 9 class, something of the Falcon Heavy class, and then something of the SLS class. It doesn't have to be... Uh, I'm just going to be using those rockets, but the ideas are going to be uh, shiftable from one rocket to another. But I didn't want to spend a lot of time on the launchers. I wanted to spend the time on the missions, and I want it to be sort of a serious thing. But uh, I will be doing some modifications to SLS, and we'll get to that down the road. And of course I have my own little space shuttle, and we'll discuss why I have that once we get to it, which is much further down the road. Anyway, here we have the docking with the station. And it takes a little while for it to recognize that these guys are, are really, really, really close together. Uh, yeah, docking port magnetism and realism overhaul, it's not what you expect from stock. Nope. Anyway, but we've got done. I opened the hatches and attempt to transfer like that. But I guess Connected well, connected Living Spaces definitely doesn't like the way I have those tanks in the way. But given the way the Dragon Capsules were docked directly to each other and still I couldn't transfer between them, probably Connected Living Space just doesn't like anything at all at this point. 
Okay, so I have to EVA out, and that means EVAing four Kerbals to that habitat. And uh, here is the first lot. I'm always nervous about EVAs, but uh, I'm taking it slow here to make sure everything goes right. Frankly, right now, the way I have it, this is all working out much harder than in real life, isn't it? Uh, in real life, they can actually pass through those docking ports, uh, though maybe not with the tanks in a way, but still. Uh, we've had a lot more trouble, and we're gonna have to fix a bunch of stuff. You'll see something else we're gonna have to fix in a moment, once I get this Kerbal in. Now, this little habitat, this uh, inflatable hab, uh, carries three Kerbals. And actually, it's a real thing. It's uh, Bigelow Aerospace is making these habitats, so these are modeled after those. And uh, anyway, here comes the problem. As the last of the Kerbals from the capsule EVAs and tries to go in here, it carries only three Kerbals, so of course this is full. So I decide that we will test out the centrifuge and see if it actually gives the Kerbals exercise, so I move him over to that. And uh, getting on there. When I try to have him board, it says this is a full module. Well, that's not right. There are no Kerbals inside. So, what's up? Well, I try a few different things eventually, like uh, having the center view stop. But you'll see that it says module crew 0 out of 0. That doesn't change. Now, in the VAB, it said it had uh, crew room for 4. But uh, here it does not. So anyway, uh, I ultimately try and stop it, restart it, do all that stuff. It doesn't actually stop spinning. There's no way to stop it from spinning. But I undeploy it and redeploy it and stuff like that. And still that does not change. I found out in the configuration where we have that problem. You see keep fit there, which is uh, what will force us to have exercise. I might have to dump that if it turns out that we can't get that centrifuge working. I'll just have to pretend that uh, we can have them keep fit with the centrifuge since I can't get them in there. But yeah, you can see maximum crew 4. I, uh, in the configuration I see where it has a problem, I, I can now move crew into it after testing, but it still doesn't give them exercise. So I can't figure that out. It's supposed to, but it doesn't. Anyway, what you see here is me building our ISRU test bed. So we need to test the ability to drill for ore and convert it to the fuels that we need, uh, especially um, methane, hydrogen, and oxygen. And so this is the test that we're going to do on the moon that I'm putting together right here. This ISR unit, unit is uh, from Planetary Base Inc. It works exactly like the ISR unit in stock, except I've adjusted the stock configuration to give us the fuels that we need based on the idea that what we call ore is actually 10% calcite, 12% hydrated hematite, 20% magnesite, 20% iron carbonate, and 38% iron uh, oxide, iron 3 oxide. So I adjusted the ISR unit. You see here me highlighting the fact that I adjusted the Meerkat landing assist, so that uses MH and N204. I actually gave it the exact same stats as the Super Draco. So it has the same stats as the Super Dracos we have on the Dragon uh, version 2 capsule. Here I've got the huge solar piles that we need. So. Uh, obviously, breaking down ore is not a real thing. Uh, it, you would want gaseous or liquid uh, elements to work with. Uh, water can be found on both the Moon and Mars, potentially. So, yeah, uh, going for these uh, minerals would not be the best way to get the carbon, oxygen, hydrogen you need to make your fuel. But, uh, while we're doing this, I decide to go ahead with it. And we have huge power consumption needs. The RTGs are not enough to do it for those who thought about that. Don't mention RTGs until we get to Pluto or Neptune because they don't provide much power at all. So we need the huge solar panels for it. And here I'm putting together the stage. Why go with one SS engine when you can have five? And so that'll be our um, getting to the moon while well, getting into orbit around the moon. I think we'll be using the block uh, 1B SLS. So actually the second stage of the SLS will get us to the moon. Uh, the um, Estes stage is actually to get into orbit and then start our descent. So there we have it. Yeah, I mean, uh, basically doing it this way makes it even harder on me. So again, keeping with the theme that what I'm doing here is even harder than real life. Now on the launch pad, I noticed that my control, my controller is backwards. You can see it's pointing at the ground instead of up. So that's a good thing that uh, that was a mistake because that made me remember that I needed antennae, 
And the fact that I needed antennae made me remember that we don't actually have uh, an ore detection satellite around the moon. We have no way to detect ore, so we need to send that first. We're not going to be using this to do the detection. Um, yep, so here we go. Here is the detection satellite that we will launch first. And I actually, at this point, didn't know for sure whether they had put ore on the moon or any of the ISRU stuff on the moon because this is realism overhaul and the moon looks different from it does in stock and I didn't know whether it was configured properly so this is all a process of discovery uh, chat was also very helpful here in reminding me to put some solar panels on that thing so thank you people on twitch twitch viewers for keeping me straight there so third Falcon 9 launch of this episode sorry about that um, chat wanted me to launch out of Tanagashima, so I decided to do that because we I didn't want another nighttime launch. The downside was that once I got there, uh, it would only let me do physical time warp, so I had to launch even though we weren't at the preferred inclination. Uh, this means that I'm going to have to do an off-plane transfer to the moon, which is not the worst thing that could happen, but it's a little bit trickier. So here we go, Tanagashima, Japan. And a daytime launch this time of the Falcon 9, so at least we're changing up things a bit like that. Here we go. And at least the launcher system is reliable, even though we we're, we're having trouble with the Dragon Capsule and the Centrifuge and other stuff. Our launchers are doing pretty, pretty good right now. We are now past the speed of sound and accelerating nominally. You can see that the relative inclination to the moon is 57 degrees, which is about as bad as it gets from this inclination. I think it can get up to 60 degrees. So yeah, not a great situation. But anyway, we move on. And here we'll have first stage separation. I... I was a little late there. I didn't reserve as much as I intended to. I only got by 1100 meters per second. I'm getting later and later on the separation of first stage. Not a great thing. Anyway, uh, here we go. Decoupling of the fairing. Sorry, I didn't have the sound for that. Or at least I didn't have a sound that I really liked for that. Anyway. Everything looking fine. There is southern Japan right there. And actually Korea, you can see over there. By the way, SpaceX does have long-term plans to potentially recover the second stage of the Falcon 9 as well. I have no idea how that would work, and I haven't seen anything to make me believe that it could. Uh, we are going to allow the second stage to re-enter here, and so we stop short of full orbit. We separate and allow the Estes engine to bring us into orbit here. So the second stage will be dispensed with safely into the Pacific Ocean. And uh, there we have it. We are in orbit. And so now I plot for the off-plane transfer to the moon. And that's what you see going on here from, from one of the nodes and hitting the moon uh, a little bit off from the other node. And uh, it'll be... It's, it's a little bit of a trick to get even close to the moon. But anyway, we do want to pull orbit around the moon to do the scanning, so at least we don't have to really get tight around the moon or anything like that. Here's translunar injection. We've got 5,500 meters per second using both stages, so way more than enough to get into the proper orbit around the moon, just in case we do something silly, but uh, I don't think that's likely to happen with these hypergolic fuels, relightable engines. It's all good. So, Estes does its job with about, well, close to 800 meters per second left, which means that the Estes itself could get us into orbit. We don't even need the two kilonewton thrusters that we have on the probe. I make minor adjustments using the RCS system. And, uh, yep. There we go. That is our approach to the moon and entering lunar SOI. You can see a satisfactory polar orbit, though I decided to make a correction. I actually want to bring the orbit all the way down into a crashing trajectory to the moon so that we dispense with this stage. So here I burn the SS engine so that it will crash into the moon. Okay, so there we go. Uh, crash trajectory. So we won't leave any space junk uh, on that stage either. So separation. 
And the two kilonewton thrusters will get some work after all, but first I boost my orbit back up to a safe one using the RCS. And actually I boost it up to where the scanner will, will work properly, because we don't want to be too close to the surface. So yeah, about 600 kilometers. We will uh, keep it loose. And uh, yeah, well, we dumped some Delta V. Maybe some scientific tests can be done with the remnants of the second stage impacting, not the second stage, the Estes stage impacting the surface of the moon. Lunar orbit insertion proceeded nominally. See that here, inclination quite good. I have to say it's nice for a change not to have to deal with tight budgets because otherwise this this whole thing would have been incredibly wasteful. Uh, we used too heavy a launcher, we have all sorts of Delta V extra, but uh, yep. Sandbox for the win in this case. Alright, so let's start the scanner out and taking a look at the results. I am pleasantly surprised that we seem to have some some stuff on the moon, but that's not actually ore. It turns out there's a lot of resources available. And uh, so it looks like it's configured for all the things. And ore is actually quite replete except for that patch right there. So we have to fine tune the cutoff to see where it's actually highly concentrated. To conclude the stream, I decided to identify exactly where I wanted to land our test for the ISRU unit. And so here I've upped the cutoff, there's a crater there, but as we uh, tune up the cutoff, I see that that's not quite the best place. In fact, there's a clear crater right there that seems more likely, and that's Grimaldi Crater. I looked on the map of the moon and decided that that would be the place that we would aim for. It's relatively equatorial, seems like it's easy to reach. And yeah, so that's where we will deploy the ISRU unit on the next attempt using the SLS Block 1B. So with that, please do remember to join me on the live streams on Sundays at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 6 p.m. GMT. We will have music. The pace will be a little bit slower, but you will get to provide input in real time. If you enjoyed this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.